death, resurrection and hell. The text is based on the book Death, Resurrection and Hell by Harum Yahya. Say, death from which you are fleeing will certainly catch up with you. Then you will be returned to the knower of the unseen and the visible, and he will inform you about what you did. Surah al jumwa Death may catch up with you at any time. Who knows? Perhaps this is the moment. Or it may be much closer than you have ever expected. You can never know that you will still be alive in the next hour. Even if it proves to be so, nothing can guarantee you another hour. Let alone an hour, not even after a single moment is it certain that you will still be living. Death will most likely come upon you at a time when only a moment before the thought of death never entered your mind. Numerous aims pertaining to life occupy man's mind. To finish high school, to enter university, to graduate, to have a respectable occupation, to marry, to bring up children, to lead a peaceful life. These are among the broadest and most ordinary plans of man. These aside, there are thousands of other little plans we devise to sort out our personal circumstances. None of these plans are certain to occur, yet death will, with 100% certainly, occur. After years of hard work, a student succeeds in entering university, yet dies on the way to class. Someone who has been recently hired for a job loses his life on the first morning, commuting to his work or a traffic accident ends the lives of a newly married couple on their wedding day. At such a stage, plans no longer avail, leaving behind plans doomed to remain unfinished for all eternity, they head for a point of no return, and yet it is a destination they never planned for. Ironically, for years they spent too much time detailing plans which would never be put into operation, yet never gave a thought to the one certain thing that would happen. How then should a man of wisdom and conscience establish his priorities? Does he have to make his plans for the one thing certain to happen or for something he does not know will happen? The majority, it is evident, give priority to goals which they can never be certain of accomplishing. No matter which phase of life they are passing through, they resolutely plan for a better and more fulfilling future. Yet the fact remains that all plans are doomed to that absolute end called death. Thus, it is irrational to disregard death, which is certain to occur. In this program, it is intended to make man ponder over this issue that he avoids thinking about and warn him against an eminent and inescapable event. This great event is certain to happen. Avoiding thinking about it cannot by any means provide a solution. Throughout history, man has successfully coped with many seemingly intractable problems but death has remained inescapable. Everyone who appears on this earth, no matter when, is destined to die. Man only lives until a certain day and then dies. While some die very young, some others face death in their old age. Nothing a man possesses, neither possessions, nor fortune, status, fame, grandeur, confidence, nor good looks can repel death. Without exception, all men are feeble against death and will always be so. The majority of people avoid thinking about death. It never occurs to them that this absolute end will befall them one day. Yet, no matter how much these people try to escape from the thought of death while they are alive, they will face the fact of death. In the Quran, this end is stated thus. Every self will taste death, 
you will be paid your wages in full on the day of resurrection. Anyone who is distanced from the fire and admitted to the garden has triumphed. The life of the world is just the enjoyment of delusion. Surah Al-Imran, 185 Death does not occur by chance. As is the case with all other incidents, it happens by Allah's decree. Just as the birth date of a man is predestined, so also is the date of his death. Right down to the very last second, man rushes towards that last moment, rapidly leaving behind every hour, every minute granted to him. The majority of people, however, assume death to be the last point of a logical sequence of events. Yet, death also, like life, occurs according to a destiny determined by Allah. Destiny is Allah's perfect creation of all events past and future in timelessness. Allah is the one who creates the concept of time and space from nothing, who keeps time and space under his control and who is not bound by them. The sequence of events which we experienced in the past or which we will experience in the future is, moment by moment, planned and created in the sight of Allah. Allah creates time, thus He is not bound by it. In His sight, everything has already taken place and finished. This is similar to the images on a film strip. Just as the images on a film cannot exercise any influence on the film and change it, human beings who play their individual roles in life cannot influence the flow of events recorded on the destiny strip. Human beings have no influence whatsoever on destiny. Just the contrary. It is destiny which is the determining factor in people's lives. Man, an absolute component of destiny, is not separate and independent from it. Let alone changing destiny, man is unable to go beyond the boundaries of destiny. It is like an actor slipping out of the video cassette, acquiring a physical existence, and starting making changes in the film by deleting unfavorable scenes or adding new ones. This would surely be an irrational suggestion. For this reason, no matter whether a man thinks about it or not, he should know that the time he will face death is determined for certain in his destiny, and that his destiny is created by Allah. Trying not to think about death is no solution. On the contrary, the more he thinks about the closeness of death and works for the life in the hereafter, the better it will be for him. However, Although the majority of people are extremely sensitive about the issues linked to their own interests, they display indifference towards death. Yet death ought to be a matter of paramount concern. In the Quran, this state of mind peculiar to those who do not hold firmly to faith is defined by Allah in one word, heedlessness. This state of mind is described in the first verse of Surah Al-Anbiya as follows. Mankind's reckoning has drawn very close to them, yet they heedlessly turn away. Surah Al-Anbiya 1 As the verse makes clear, people approach a step closer the day of account each day. Despite this, however, in their heedlessness, they never think how they will give an account of their actions. Their attempt to close the subject when they are reminded of death their spending their lives drifting in the daily flow of events, the recurrence of births every day around them, and the belief that they can fulfill the requirements of religion in their old age anyway, are the main reasons for their heedlessness. The rationale some people hold that they can get out of hell after they receive punishment is a lie. There is no evidence for this in the Quran. In the Quran, the rationale of such people is stated as follows. They say, the fire will only touch us for a number of days. Say, have you made a contract with Allah then? Allah will not break his contract. Or are you rather saying about Allah what you do not know? No, indeed. Those who accumulate bad actions and are surrounded by their mistakes are the companions of the fire, remaining in it timelessly, forever. Surah Al-Baqarah, 80, 81. 
Not thinking or deceiving oneself with distorted reasoning that is not included in the Quran is not an escape or deliverance for anybody in the world. No matter how strongly the individual resists, wherever he seeks refuge or however he tries to escape, he will encounter his own death. He has no other choice. Ahead of him, there is no other exit. That is why we need to stop deceiving ourselves or disregarding facts and strive to earn the good pleasure of Allah during this period predetermined by Him which we call our life. Only Allah knows when this time will be over. Have you ever thought about how you will die, what death looks like, and what will happen at the moment of death? So far, nobody has appeared who died and was raised again or who could share his actual experiences and feelings about death. This being the case, it is technically impossible to gather information regarding what death is like and what one feels at the moment of death. Allah, the one who bestows life upon man and takes it back in due course, informs us in the Quran about how death actually occurs. Thus, the Quran is the only source from which we can learn about how death really occurs and what someone who dies actually experiences and feels. When we look at the Quran, we see a very interesting fact. Death, as referred to in the Quran, is quite unlike the medical death people observe from outside. Primarily, certain verses acquaint us with events as seen by the dying person himself which can never be perceived by others. This is related in the Surah Al-Waqwa. Why then, when death reaches his throat and you are at that moment looking on, we are nearer him than you, but you cannot see us. Surah Al-Waqwa, 83-85 These events that are experienced at the moment of death will be tough for the unbelievers. The moment of death of unbelievers is stated in the Qur'an. If you could only see the wrongdoers in the throes of death when the angels are stretching out their hands saying, Yield up your souls. Today you will be repaid with the punishment of humiliation for saying something other than the truth about Allah and being arrogant about His signs. Surah Al-Anam, 93 Unlike the disbelievers' death, that of the believers is blissful. This fact is related in the Quran. The angels reclaim the souls of the just, saying to believers, Peace be upon you. Enter the garden as a reward for your labors. Surah Al-Nan 32 These verses disclose a very important and unchanging fact about death. At the moment of death, what the dying person goes through and what those nearby observe are dissimilar experiences. For instance, a disbeliever may be perceived to experience a peaceful death from outside. However, the soul in a totally different dimension now tastes death in a very painful way. Alternatively, the soul of a believer, despite seemingly suffering great pain, is taken by angels gently, as stated in the verse. In brief, the medical death of the body and the death of the soul which is referred to in the Qur'an are totally different events. The moment of death is a great torment for disbelievers, whereas it is a bliss for believers. At the moment of death, as the soul leaves the dimension of the human being lives in, it leaves behind the lifeless body that is a sort of outer casing. Have you ever thought in detail about what will befall this casing when one dies? One day you will die, while going to the grocery to buy bread. A car will hit you, or a fatal disease will bring your life to an end, or simply your heart will stop beating for no apparent reason at all. From then on, you will have no relation with your body whatsoever. That body you assume to be yourself all your life will turn into an ordinary heap of flesh. With your death, your body will be carried by other people. 
Then that body will be carried to the morgue, where it will remain for a night. The lifeless body, now very rigid, will be washed all over with cold water. Meanwhile, the traces of death will start to appear, and some parts of the body will turn purple. Then the body will be wrapped in a shroud and put in a wooden coffin. The hearse will be ready to take the coffin. Proceeding towards the graveyard, life will be as always on the streets. Seeing that a hearse is passing by, some people will show respect, but the majority will go on with their daily tasks. At the graveyard, the coffin will be carried by those who love you or by those who seem to love you. Then people will arrive at the inescapable destination, the grave. Your corpse will be taken out of the coffin and placed in the pit. Finally, people with shovels will start to cover your body with soil. Soil will be thrown onto the shroud. Then the soil will gradually cover your shroud. Soon, the funeral will be over and people will leave the grave. Then the graveyard will return to its deep silence. Those attending the funeral will go on with their everyday lives and for your buried body, life will no longer be meaningful. A beautiful house, a pretty person, a breathtaking landscape will mean nothing. From then on, the only certainty for the body will be the soil and the worms and bacteria inhabiting it. That is the way a human being's life, created in the best of forms, comes to the most horrible end possible. Why? That it does so actually carries a very important inner message in itself. Seeing this terrible end, man has to acknowledge that he is not a body himself, but a soul encased within a body. In other words, he has to acknowledge that he has an existence beyond his body. Such a striking end, with its many lessons, is made ready for man so that he may understand that he is not mere flesh and bones. The majority of people have an inadequate concept of death. Death is the moment life ends is one of these. However, there is a very thin border between this world, which is a temporary abode, and our actual life, the hereafter. Death is the instrument which raises this curtain. By death, man will break off all his relations with his body and this world, and he will start his eternal life with his newly created body. The hereafter is not far away, as it is assumed. Allah can end the life of a man at any moment he wills it and make him pass to the hereafter. This transition will occur in a very short period, in the blink of an eye. This is similar to waking up from a dream. A Quranic verse describes the brevity of this world as follows. He will say, how many years did you tarry on the earth? They will say, We tarried there for a day or part of a day. Ask those able to count. He will say, You only tarried there for a little while if you did but know. Did you suppose that we created you for amusement and that you would not return to us? Surah al Muminum, 112-115 when death comes, dreams come to an end and man starts his real life. Man, who remained on earth for a period as short as the blink of an eye, comes to the presence of Allah to give an account of his deeds in this world. If he has kept death in his mind all throughout his life and lived to attain Allah, he will be saved. In the Quran, the words of those who are given their books in their right hands are quoted as follows. Here, come and read my book. I counted on meeting my reckoning. Surah al haqwa 19-20 Yet, those who reject the hereafter, which is their real abode, compress everything they want into the very short time of this life. That is why they want to make the most of this life 
without observing any limits. Not making a distinction between right and wrong, they seek to satisfy all their tastes in this world. This attitude is essentially based on the notion that death will put an end to all the joys and pleasures of this world. Amassing fortunes in this world as if life would last forever, disbelievers perceive life as a competition. Throughout their lives, they take pride in possessions and children. This pride gives them a sense of artificial superiority, which causes them to drift completely away from the thought of the hereafter. Yet, they are suffering from a great deception, because the purpose of their presence in this world is to be tested. Allah gives man many warnings and messages to make him ponder upon death and the hereafter. In one verse, Allah draws attention to the trials given as a warning to man. Do they not see that they are tried once or twice in every year? But still they do not turn back. They do not pay heed. Surah al tawbah 126 Indeed, the majority of people encounter various trials, so that they may frequently ask for forgiveness and take heed. These may take place very rarely, once or twice in a year as mentioned in the verse. Alternatively, they may be small daily troubles. Man witnesses accidents, deaths or injuries. In the face of such events, man should remember the calamities can at any time befall him and at any moment this testing period may end. Such an awareness makes him sincerely turn to Allah, seek refuge in Him, and ask for forgiveness from Him. The lessons believers draw from the adversity they encounter are well learned and remembered. Yet the same events make a totally different impact on disbelievers and their reaction is totally different. By rejecting the closeness of death or trying to forget it, they seek relief. However, this deceptive method only does them harm. This is because Allah reprieves them till a predetermined time, and this period, contrary to what they think, works against them. In another Quranic verse, it says, Those who are disbelievers should not imagine that the extra time we grant them is for their good. We only allow them more time so that they will increase their evil doing. They will have a humiliating punishment. Surah Al-Imran, 178 as a conclusion, man continues to be tested by countless events befalling him. His success in dealing with them earns him rewards in the eternal life, while his failure earns him punishment. Nobody knows when his period of testing will end. In the words of the Quran, the term of every life is fixed. This term can sometimes be long, but it can sometimes be short. The truth is, however, that even the period we regard as being long rarely extends beyond 70 or 80 years. That is why, rather than engage in making long-term plans, man has to be guided by the Quran and live by its principles, knowing that he will have to give an account of all his deeds in the hereafter. Otherwise, failure to prepare oneself for the eternal life Missing the one and only opportunity granted for this purpose and deserving hell for all eternity will be a painful situation indeed. The only destination of someone who is deprived of paradise forever is nowhere else but hell. That is why every moment spent wasting our time in meaningless pursuits in this world is a great loss and a giant step taken towards an atrocious end. Since this is so, this fact should take precedence over everything else in this world. Just as a man prepares himself for the possible situations which he will confront in the course of his life, he needs to devote similar and even greater efforts to becoming prepared for the next life. This would be the wisest plan. That is because the one who will die will be him. He will experience everything that happens after death all alone. Therefore, this subject directly concerns man's self. To those seeking eternal salvation, Allah commands the following. You who believe, have fear of Allah and let each self look to what it has sent forward for tomorrow. Have fear of Allah. Allah is aware of what you do. Do not be like those who have forgotten Allah so that He has made them forget themselves. 
Such people are evildoers. Surah Al-Hashr, 18-19. Yet man still wants to deny what is ahead of him, asking, So when is the day of resurrection? But when the eyesight is dazzled and the moon is eclipsed, and the sun and moon are fused together, on that day man will say, Where can I run? No, indeed, there will be no safe place. That day the only resting place will be your Lord. Surah al Qiyamah, 5-12 in the Quran, it is stated that apart from all the created beings, the universe will also confront death. It is not only man who is mortal. All animals and plants die. Even the planets and stars die. Death is the destiny common to all that has been created. In the presence of Allah, on a predestined day, all men, all living beings, the world, the sun, the moon, the stars, in brief, all the material universe will disappear. In the Quran, this day is called the Day of Resurrection. This is the day mankind will stand before the Lord of all the worlds. Just as the death of man is terrifying, so is the death of the universe. On the Day of Resurrection, those who did not have faith previously will have an intense feeling of Allah's greatness and might. That is why the Day of Resurrection is a day of grief, torment, regret, pain, and great confusion for disbelievers. A person witnessing the Day of Resurrection will be seized by a great fear. This undefinable fear is hundreds of times more intense than all the fear one is likely to experience in this world. The Quran provides a detailed account of each phase of the Day of Resurrection how this great event will happen and what will happen to people who will go through it are all described in a striking way. The day of resurrection begins when the trumpet is blown. This is the sign of the total destruction of the world and all the universe and the beginning of the end. This is the point of no return. This is the sound declaring that the life of the world has come to an end for all and that the real life has begun. The sound of the trumpet will surely create a great dread and unrest among disbelievers. An imperceptible, non-definable vibration with no apparent source will permeate the entire world. And hence, all people will acknowledge that something is beginning. The sound of the trumpet will lead to ongoing unrest, panic, and horror. A great tremor and a deafening blast follows the sound of the trumpet. At this moment, people recognize that they are face to face with a horrible disaster. It is obvious that the world and life is about to cease to exist. This atmosphere is described in the verses in this way. When the deafening blast comes, the day a man will flee from his brother and his mother and his father and his wife and his children. On that day, every man among them will have concerns enough of his own. Surah Abasa, 33-37 When the earth is convulsed with its quaking and the earth then shakes off its burdens and man asks, What does this mean? On that day it will impart all its tidings, because the Lord will have inspired it. Surah Al-Zilzal, 1-5 through five. The calamities which will occur on that day are beyond one's imagination. Man is unable to visualize them even if he tries. Mountains, the most awe-inspiring, unshakable structures of the earth, are set in motion. They are lifted from their roots and crushed. Even a minor earthquake spreads terror into the hearts of people and inspires in them feelings of insecurity. It makes them leave their homes and spend the whole night out in the streets. This being so, the type of disaster so dreadful as to cause the mountains to shift proves to be unbearable. In the Quran, 
The mountains on that day are depicted as follows. So when the trumpet is blown with a single blast, and the earth and the mountains are lifted and crushed with a single blow, on that day the dread event will come to pass. Surah Hal Aqwa, 13 to 15. With its present faculties, it is unlikely that the human mind can conceive of the horror of the day of resurrection. However, that the destruction will be in due proportion with Allah's might gives an idea of its dimensions. For example, the surge of oceans and the overflowing of seas, the greatest components and sources of life on the earth, is one of the examples given in the Quran about that day. On the day of resurrection, not only the earth, but also space and the entire universe will be destroyed. The predetermined time of extinction will also come for the sky, the moon, the sun and the planets, as well as the earth. Whatever lies underground, the mountains and oceans. The Quran states that on that day, what you are promised will certainly happen. When the stars are extinguished, when heaven is split open, when the mountains are pulverized, Surah Al-Mursalat, 7 through 10. On the day of resurrection, all beings and established orders in which people attribute eternity will collapse and will ultimately be reduced to nothing. The sky is one of them. From the moment we are born, the atmosphere proves to be a protective roof. Yet, on the day of resurrection, the roof will collapse and burst into pieces. The air and atmosphere which surround man and give him life with its every breath will become like molten brass, in the words of the Quran, and will burn with intensity. A comparison drawn between the fear created by the natural disasters on this planet and the horror of the events of the day of resurrection may provide some understanding about that day. Earthquakes and volcanic eruptions are the catastrophes that frighten man most. The earth crust cracked by an earthquake or a volcanic eruption dispels the regularity of everyday life in a moment. This makes man appreciate the solid ground he normally steps on with confidence. Nevertheless, despite all the pain they give, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions tend to be short-lived and localized. An earthquake or an eruption lasts for a certain period of time. Wounds heal, pains are forgotten, and in time they become faint memories. But the day of resurrection is neither like an earthquake nor any other disaster. Incredible acts of destruction occurring one after another signify that everything has come to a point of no return. For instance, an event beyond one's imagination will happen. Heaven will crack and split apart. This is the collapse of all the known laws of physics and the concepts one has trusted so far. The heaven and the earth, which have maintained an existence for millions of years, are crushed by the one who constructed them. The day of resurrection, as is explained in the Quran, will be marked by the sky splitting apart, the stars being strewn about, and the seas flooding and overflowing. All the fear, dread, and confusion on the day of resurrection will be caused by the disbeliever's heedlessness. The more heedless a person is, the more his dread will be on that day. Those who assumed Allah to be unaware of their deeds realize at that moment that Allah postponed their judgment until the day of resurrection. Because Allah has been, until that time, merely giving them respite till a day on which their gaze will be transfixed. The strongest bond in this world is the love and feeling of protection a mother feels for her child. The intensity of the day of resurrection will break even this strong bond. It is described in Surah Al-Hajj, how pregnant women will abort their babies through fear and people will be running swaying about like drunks. Mankind, have fear of your Lord. The quaking of the hour is a terrible thing. On the day they see it, Every nursing woman will be oblivious of the baby at her breast, and every pregnant woman will abort the contents of her womb. And you will think people drunk when they are not drunk. It is just that the punishment of Allah is so severe. Surah Al-Hajj 1 through 2 Apart from fear and dread, another grievous feeling people will experience on that day is complete despair. 
mankind takes necessary precautions against all possible disasters, against the most lethal calamity, the most powerful earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, or the most horrible nuclear war. Man finds ways to protect himself and builds shelters. However, on that day, there will not remain a single secure place where he can take refuge. When the trumpet is blown for the first time, heaven and earth will be crushed and the whole material world will come to an end. Not a living soul will be left. And then the trumpet will be blown for the second time. Those who deny the hereafter and resurrection in the world will be raised from their graves. The Quran gives an account of these happenings as follows. The trumpet will be blown and those in the heavens and those on the earth will lose all consciousness except those Allah wills. Then it will be blown a second time and at once they will be standing upright, looking on, and the earth will shine with the pure light of the Lord. Surah Az-Sumar, 68-69 In the verses, Allah gives a detailed account of the situations which will take place during and after the rise of the dead. As related in the Quran, this great event will occur thus. By the time the trumpet is blown for the second time, the dead will be called from the earth. Upon this call, they will rapidly emerge from their graves with downcast eyes like swarming locusts. As if hastening on to a goal, they will follow the caller with their necks extended towards him. This call will be unlike any they have heard before. This call will begin as people are still under the ground and continue as they rise and emerge from their graves, turn towards the caller and arrive at the place to which they are summoned. The bewilderment of the disbelievers at that moment is described in the verses in this way. The trumpet will be blown, and at once they will be sliding from their graves towards their Lord. They will say, Alas for us, who has raised us from this resting place. This is what the All-Merciful promised us. The messengers were telling the truth. Surah Yasin 51 through 52. The exclamation, alas for us, is an expression of great pain and dismay. The disbeliever who witnesses his own resurrection realizes that God's envoys who conveyed the message throughout his life had told the truth. He then grasps that he will be subjected to the eternal torment which the disbelievers had been promised. At that moment, he sheds all doubts on the subject and comes to terms with the fact that there is just not anything like eternal sleep. His disappointment is intensified by his diminishing hopes of salvation from the forthcoming torment. On the day of resurrection, disbelievers feel fear, horror, and they are desperate. Their general appearance is even more frightening. As related in the verses, their faces have lost all spiritual light. They are dark, dust-covered. With this terrible and degraded appearance, the disbelievers will be distinguished from the believers at first sight. This is the beginning of the end of this group of people who waged war against the words and signs of Allah and remained arrogant. On that day, a person will be too occupied to worry about others. He will even abandon his own mother, father, spouse, and children and thus the most precious social bonds in this life will come to a bitter end. The horror of that day will render all close relationships and kinship meaningless. The only precious thing remaining will be faith. Then when the trumpet is blown that day there will be no family ties between them. They will not be able to question one another. Those whose scales are heavy are the successful ones. Those whose scales are light are the losers of their souls, remaining in hell timelessly forever. Surah Al-Muminum, 101-103 Bonds and family ties break down in such a way that people would give their so-called beloved sons, spouses, brothers, and even all their relatives in ransom for their own salvation. 
Similarly, people will want to offer everything they owned in this world in ransom for their salvation. This offer is actually an indication of the vanity of this life. The majority of people chase after trivial goals in the worldly life. However, as the Quran informs us, in his desperate efforts to be saved, a person will be willing to pay not just a single house, but all possible possessions in the world, all the gold and silver treasures of the world in ransom for his own personal salvation. However, these are all futile efforts because Allah is the owner of all the possessions in the world. Salvation, on the other hand, remained behind in the worldly life. It is too late now, and as promised, hellfire has already started burning. Each passing day in time brings us even closer to the day of resurrection. Each passing hour, minute, or even second is a step taken towards death, resurrection, and the moment of reckoning. Life, like an hourglass, flows continuously in this direction. There is no way to stop or to reverse it. All people are following this path. And finally, the Lord of all the worlds will take account from His servants whom He created. If man fails to serve his Creator in this life on earth and to prepare for this great day, then he shall suffer a keen regret. All his deeds he engaged in throughout his life and all his thoughts will be revealed. This is the moment closest to paradise and hell. People will see what they had presented for their eternal life. This is related in the Quran as follows. That day people will emerge segregated to see the results of their actions. Whoever does an atom's weight of good will see it. Whoever does an atom's weight of evil will see it. Surah Al-Zilzal 6-8 through eight. The reckoning is grueling for those who live not by the laws of Allah but by their own desires or by the distorted values, beliefs and principles of their unbelieving society. In contrast to this, the way believers will give their accounts will be quite easy. After giving his account, the believer will remain in eternal bliss. After all, he lived by the principles laid down by his Creator, and his sins are forgiven by Allah, the Merciful. Thus, he attains paradise, a place filled with Allah's boundless favor and is kept remote from hellfire. He, the denier, reflected and he schemed. Curse him how he schemed. Again curse him how he schemed. Then he looked. Then he frowned and glowered. Then he drew back and was proud. He said, This is nothing but magic from the past. This is nothing but the words of a mere mortal. I will cast him into the fire. What will convey to you what the fire is? It does not spare anyone and it does not ease up, ceaselessly scorching the flesh. Surah Al-Mutathir, 18-29 Hell is designed for those who reject Allah and the hereafter as a place where they will remain for all eternity. That is solely because the disbelievers are guilty of great wrongs and Allah's justice entails their punishment. Being ungrateful and rebellious to the Creator, the one who gives man a soul is the greatest wrong that can be committed in the whole universe. Therefore, in the hereafter, there is grievous punishment for such a deadly sin. That is the purpose that hell serves. Man is created to be a servant of Allah. If he denies the main purpose of his creation, then he surely receives what he deserves. Allah states the following in one of the verses. Those who are too arrogant to serve me will surely find themselves in hell, in humiliation. Surah Al-Ghafir, 60 Hell, this place where the attributes of Allah, the Al-Jabbar, the Compeller, the Al-Qahar, the Subduer, and the Al-Muntaqim, the Avenger, 
are manifested for all eternity is specially created to inflict suffering on man. In the Quran, hell is depicted as if it were a living being. This creature is full of rage at and hatred for disbelievers. Since the day it was created, it waits impatiently to take its revenge upon disbelievers. Hell's desire for disbelievers can never be quenched. When it encounters those who deny its rage intensifies, it rages vehemently and roars. The creation of this fire serves a dual purpose, to serve as a warning and to inflict unbearable torment on those who did not heed the warning. Indeed, it will carry out its duty and give the gravest of all pains. After the judgment of disbelievers takes place in the presence of Allah, they will be sent to hell for all eternity. For the disbelievers, there is no opportunity to escape. There will be billions of people, yet this huge crowd will not offer the disbelievers an opportunity to escape or to be ignored. No one can hide himself in this crowd. Those sent to hell come with a witness and one who drives the soul on. From the verses, it is obvious that when they are recreated, all disbelievers will understand what will befall them. They will remain all alone. No friends, relatives, or supporters will be there to help. Disbelievers will not have the strength to be arrogant, and they will look and keep averting their eyes. In the Quran, Allah describes the events as follows. Those who are disbelievers will be driven to hell in companies, and when they arrive there and its gates are opened, its custodians will say to them, Did messengers from amongst you not come to you reciting your Lord's signs to you and warning you of the meeting of this day of yours? They will say, Indeed they did, but the decree of punishment has been proved true against the disbelievers. They will be told, Enter the gates of hell and stay there timelessly forever. How evil is the abode of the arrogant! Surah al-Zumar, 71-72 Depending upon the extent of their rebellion against Allah, people are subjected to a classification. Disbelievers are placed in their individual locations in hell according to the sins they have committed. It is stated thus in the Quran. He will say, Enter the fire together with the nations of jinn and men who have passed away before you. Each time a nation enters, it will curse its sister nation until, when they are all gathered together in it, the last of them will say to the first, Our Lord, those are the ones who misguided us, so give them a double punishment in the fire. He will say, Each will receive double, but you do not know it. Surah Al-Araf 38 as soon as disbelievers arrive in hell, the doors are locked behind them. Here they see the most fearsome sights. They immediately understand that they will be presented to hell, the place where they will remain for all eternity. The closed doors indicate that there will be no salvation. Allah describes the state of disbelievers as follows. And as for those who disbelieve in our signs, they are the people on the left hand. Of them is fire closed over. Surah Al-Balad, 19-20 The torment in the Quran is described as a severe punishment and a painful chastisement. The descriptions of it are inadequate to give a full understanding of the punishment in hell. Being unable to suffer even minor burns in the world, Man cannot grasp being exposed to fire for all eternity. What is more, the pain that a fire gives in the world does not stand comparison with the severe torture of hell. No pain can be similar to that of hell. None punishes as he will punish on that day. None binds as he will then bind. Surah Al-Farj 25-26 as described in the Quran, there is life in hell, yet it is a life in which every moment is full of torture and anguish. No less than physical pain, mental pain is also severe in hell, like humiliation, regret, and hopelessness. Along with all this, 
punishments being eternal is another suffering that gives great pain. Those disbelievers who assume that they could get out of hell after they receive their punishment will experience a great terror as they realize the reality of eternal punishment. If it were to end after millions or billions of years, even such a long-term possibility could arouse fervent hopes and remain a strong reason for happiness and joy. Yet the suffering is certainly eternal. Realizing this fact will inspire a kind of hopelessness that cannot be compared to any similar feeling in this world. According to the Quran, hell is a place for eternal punishment with its narrow, noisy, smoky places, fires burning deep in the heart, nasty food and drinks, garments of fire and liquid pitch. There is a life going on in this terrible environment. The people of hell hear, talk, and argue, and they try to escape from suffering. They burn in the fire, become thirsty and hungry, and feel regret. The people of hell live a life infinitely more debased than that of the animals in this dirty and disgusting environment. The only nourishment they have is the fruits of the bitter thorn and the tree of Zakum. Their drink, on the other hand, is blood and pus. Meanwhile, fire engulfs them everywhere. Fresh skins will be created for the burned ones. Thus, the pain of fire continues non-stop without diminishing. They are chained and whipped. Hands tied to their necks, they are cast into the core hell. Angels of punishment, in the meantime, place those who are guilty in beds of fire, with their covers also of fire. Disbelievers constantly scream to be saved from such anguish, yet they are not even answered. They want the penalty to be lightened, at least for a day. Yet in return, they again receive humiliation and torture. These scenes in hell are all real. They are even more real than our daily lives. Those who among men serve Allah as it were on the verge, those who commit sin saying, Allah will forgive us anyway, and assuming that they will stay in the fire for a few numbered days, those who make money, status, careers, and other such material things the main goals of their lives and accordingly neglect the good pleasures of Allah, those who alter the commands of Allah in accordance with their own wishes and desires, those who interpret the Qur'an according to their own interests, those who go astray from the right path, in brief, all disbelievers and hypocrites will abide in hell, except those upon whom Allah bestows His mercy and forgiveness. This is the conclusive word of Allah and will certainly be borne out. All this is a reminder to people to be saved from an eternal punishment. Those who reject the commands of Allah in this world and deny the existence of their Creator will have no salvation in the hereafter. Therefore, without losing any time, each person has to realize his situation and leave the disobedient path, because the end of this path brings great destruction. The most important thing he has to do is to surrender to Allah. Otherwise, he will suffer an eternal regret. In the Quran, the regret of disbelievers is described as follows. It may be that those who are disbelievers will wish that they had been Muslims. Leave them to eat and enjoy themselves. Let false hopes divert them. They will soon know. Surah al hirsh 2-3 the way to avoid eternal punishment, win eternal bliss, and attain the approval of Allah is quite clear. Before it is too late, have true faith in Allah. Spend your life in doing good deeds to earn His pleasure. The text is based on the book Death, Resurrection and Hell by Harum Yahya.
This audio representation is produced by the IPCI.